Hello, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast and podcast and Zoomcast. Uh, this is Bugs and Democracy, a new series here at Princeton University on the subject of fixing bugs in our crazy, crazy democracy that we have here in the United States. Uh, it's a series sponsored by the Princeton uh, Gerrymandering Project and also by the Pace Center for Civic Engagement here at Princeton University. Uh, I'm your host, Sam Wong. Now tonight we have double duty. We also have um, this being an episode of Politics and Polls, which is the podcast of Princeton University and the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, and therefore, uh, those of you who listen to that know me as your co-host and my, uh, my co-host is Julian Zelizer, professor of history over there in the corner of your screen. This is great. I'm excited to be part of this, Sam. Yeah, it's a new experiment. It's a new age here in, uh, in, in, in media, the media tentacles of politics and polls. <laughs> each over into uh, this other domain. It's going to be great. Um, tonight, I am super pleased to have as our guest, Katie Fahey, who's co-founder and executive director at The People. Uh, Katie is, uh, frankly, a star in uh, people-powered activism. There's been a big change in the United States ever since 2016, and Katie is part of that wave. Uh, she is known for founding the Michigan organization, Voters Not Politicians, and this is an organization that seemingly came out of nowhere, uh, passing Proposal 2, which in Michigan is famous for setting up uh, a Michigan Independent Commission for redistricting, taking redistricting out of the hands of legislators and putting, them in, putting it in the hands of, um, of citizens. Katie and many collaborators did this by establishing a volunteer army, and it passed in 2018 um, by a 61% majority. So, uh, so Katie also um, appears quite prominently in the documentary Slay the Dragon, which has come out quite recently. Uh, that's being released by uh, Participant Media just in the last week or so. Uh, according to her Voters Not Politicians bio, she has a passion for sustainability, public policy, and Michigan. She lives in Caledonia, Michigan. Katie, welcome and thank you for coming on. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So, Katie, it seems to me, let's see, let's do a count here. So, uh, about four years ago, you were not an activist or a reformer. You were working as a sustainability professional. So, uh, so I want to understand how it is that a sustainability professional made the transition to changing democracy in your entire state. Tell me, uh, tell our listeners uh, the story of Katie, that part of the story. Yeah, it's it certainly wasn't on purpose. Um, yeah, I studied sustainability, so uh, environmental and social oriented business practices. I started in the grocery world, grocery retail world and grocery distribution world and um, get to start looking at, you know, how can, how do we not only impact our profit margin, but how do we impact the environment, our employees, those kinds of things. Uh, but personally, I always felt like a pretty strong civic duty towards voting, like to making sure that I could vote. Uh, in Michigan, we have things called a drain commissioner um, being related to the environment that handles a lot of like the water uh, issues that come up. So I was really passionate about the 2016 drain commissioner race. Uh, always bugging my friends and family to vote. And I knew about things like gerrymandering, money in politics, the primary system. I, I remember learning about those in school um, and when paying attention to just even the news on local Michigan issues, when there would be a strong sense of, it seems like the people of Michigan want this, yet our legislature is doing this. Why is that? We had some great reporters who would cover things like gerrymandering. Um, so in 2016, there was kind of a, a, a lot of my friends and family for the very first time starting to pay attention to politics. I think that was really around Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, both kind of having this drain the swamp political revolution message. Um, I thought that was really interesting because to me, I was like, oh, we can do that by a new gerrymandering. And uh, for a lot of my friends and family, it was by electing these presidential candidates. And I thought, I wonder if we have more in common. Um, and I wonder if some of these people would also want to do things like and gerrymandering. Um, in Michigan, I think most people have heard about the Flint water crisis. Uh, not as many people know that it has its roots actually in gerrymandering, that local control being taken away from the citizens of Flint was one of the reasons why the water got switched and, and the people of Michigan had tried to repeal this law that our legislature found a loophole in and, and reinstated anyways. Um, and there was a lot of things, uh, Flint being the most egregious where life was actually lost, but there's a lot of things happening that weren't lining up with like what people wanted. And I, when I was going to work, I just kept feeling like I don't want to live in an America, in a Michigan right now where 
pretty much we have an entire city that was poisoned through like government incompetence and nobody's doing anything about it. And I don't also want to wake up in a Michigan tomorrow where this could happen again. So what, how do I get to like the root cause of what we could do to actually stop this? And that's when I thought of gerrymandering. She made this Facebook post that said, hey, I want to end gerrymandering in Michigan. If you want to help, let me know, smiley face. Not thinking it would lead to anything. I don't have like an immense amount of followers on Facebook or anything like that. But I think it was like speaking to people for them really wanting to do something and that was a solution to how we actually could. And then that got shared and I got connected with a bunch of people I'd never met before. And we started figuring out, you know, what are the tools that we have in our state to be able as citizens to bring change at this really systemic level, which is when we, in Michigan, we have a ballot initiative process where if citizens write constitutional language, gather a bunch of signatures, then they can put something up for the people of Michigan to actually vote on. And so we ended up using that ballot initiative process to go and fight for an independent citizens redistricting commission. I gotta say, when I complain on Facebook, it does not really lead to changing the laws of the state. I, I'm really uh, a little bit struck by that. So have you found, I just want to interject, uh, put on my nerd hat and put on my hat as director of the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Michigan is really especially egregious in its gerrymander and its congressional delegation, also its state legislature, are almost entirely insensitive to the will of the voters. It's really quite striking that like basically uh, over the last decade, Michigan's map has made it so that if you get into office, you're basically in for, for a decade if it's a district level office. So. Um, if I recall correctly, um, the first time you ever pointed this out, you didn't get that response. And so, and then the second time you did. So can we talk about popular awareness of gerrymandering as an issue in Michigan? Yeah, I, uh, so I, I don't know how many people are on Facebook, but on Facebook, there's this thing where it'll show you Facebook posts that you wrote previously. And even when I made the most recent Facebook post, I certainly didn't think I would be leading any kind of effort to really end it. I thought I'd just like find a bunch of other friends who wanted to go volunteer for some other group that was ending it. So um, on Facebook, when it shows you posts that you've made before, it actually turns out that almost like two years earlier, I had made almost the exact same Facebook post, but nobody even liked it. <laughs> just think was interesting. But I do think that what had happened not only between those two years was the Flint water crisis, but also just so much more um, taking away of local control from our state legislature. Uh, and I think that the moment and then reaching out to more people really spoke to like why we were able to be successful and move forward on that. It's funny, I, if I think about your background as a sustainability expert, um, it seems to me that um, that there's a connection between you working in sustainability, working in, um, uh, in, in, let's see, I think when you were an undergraduate, it looks like it, when you went to college at Aquinas College, you, you majored in sustainable business and community leadership. And I'm just detecting maybe that some of those skills ended up being pretty useful for organizing a statewide drive. Can, can we talk just a little bit about, about like the kinds of things that happened after your Facebook post got popular? Like how, how did that grow into the thousands of people? Totally, yeah. I mean, I think in general, the one nice part about um, sustainability is that you're looking at systems. So the topic of gerrymandering, I think, in particular resonated with me because it was looking at an entire system and seeing like, okay, how do you set up this structure so that it benefits the people and gets us all actual representative democracy? Uh, on the other end, though, too, working in a grocery industry, working in the grocery industry that had stores across our entire state, I had to figure out how do you develop a program that is flexible enough to adapt to a small mom and pop grocery store or a really big grocery store. And we set up like recycling programs and I had to really learn a lot about the state. When I was first getting those responses to the Facebook post, I had a bunch of people private, like sending me a private message saying like, hey, I've cared about this issue for such a long time. I just didn't know I could do anything about it. Let me know what I should do. The very first thing I did, which is actually what I did when starting a sustainability program too, I was the first one to try and start that in an organization, was I Googled it. I was like, okay, how do we end gerrymandering? I know I don't like gerrymandering. I know there's solutions. I actually haven't thought that much further ahead. I'm like, what am I personally going to do to make sure that this ends. So figuring out those tools. And then the other thing that we did that I do think is related again is I knew that it was a really big task and that people were bringing a lot of individual skills to that task. So we started trying to figure out what does everybody's unique skills, their interests, the amount of time that they have, how can we plug that in to creating a, a machine out of nothing, basically? How do we create an organization? How do we write constitutional language, gather signatures? 
So based on if people said, you know, I have done a lot of research in my past, we'd maybe throw them on the policy committee. We had people who had been former social studies teachers. Um, we put them on an education committee, figuring out how do we talk to the 9.9 .9 million people that live here in Michigan about this kind of not very easily accessible topic of redistricting and help them understand what the flaws are with the current system and also help get their input for what should a new solution look like. So slowly by dividing up the work and also looking at what are our really big milestones, how do we end gerrymandering, uh, you know, taking the constitutional language challenge and figuring out how we would do that, taking the gathering a bunch of signatures challenge and figuring out how we would do that and plugging people in is how we slowly started to grow. And I think one of the key things that we did um, also was that we looked at the values we were fighting for. We looked at what is wrong with the current process in Michigan. It's done behind closed doors. The people with the most conflict of interest are the ones who are writing these laws. Uh, people don't have a real say in being able to talk about how they would like these districts and how they'd like their communities to be represented. And we brought that into who we were as an organization as well. So when we were writing the constitutional language, we had really good intentions, but we were also technically behind an internet closed door, you know, behind a, an internet chat room somewhere trying to figure out what's the best constitutional language. And we thought, okay, so how do we actually go to the people of Michigan and ask their opinion on this? So we ended up organizing 33 town halls in 33 days where um, in Michigan we have 14 congressional districts. We went to each congressional district twice. And we met with the people who live there and we asked their opinion. We developed a survey that asked, you know, who should draw the lines? How should the lines be drawn? What should the process look like? Asking people's different opinions. And we invited anybody who wanted to be to be a part of this discussion on what are we going to change these rules to so that we can have a really effective policy moving forward. And that resonated so strongly. That's really when we started getting the people who weren't maybe as like personally nerdy and like just caring about gerrymandering all the time to think about it differently. A lot of the people who came to those town halls didn't know what gerrymandering was, but it was the first time they'd ever been asked, how do you want the, a law to look? And that meant a lot to them. And we went to a lot of the communities, you know, lots of rural communities, lots of, um, we went to urban communities too, but it's particularly in the uh, rural parts of Michigan. We had so many people saying, my own representative has never visited here, even when they're running for office. And yet you, you know, random internet people are doing this for free and to ask my opinion and to say my voice is going to count just as much as everybody else's in Michigan, even though I live here. And that meant so much to people. And that I think was another one of those ways where even if the ideas that people had ultimately weren't the ones that we adopted because they could see the process, they were actually a part of it. They saw how the policy was coming together and they saw that we were really looking at how do we come to consensus together. That meant a lot to them. Oh, I think you're on mute, possibly. You're muted. You're muted. You'll unmute. Yes, I, uh, you'd think I'd be good at that after a month of this kind of thing. But um, yes, we're, everyone, you're listening to uh, Facing Bugs of Democracy, uh, a production of the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, the Pace Center uh, for Civic Engagement, and the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, an episode of Politics and Polls. Our guest is Katie Fahey who is uh, talking about organizing during a pandemic and we're starting from her roots as an organizer in Michigan. If you have questions, you can uh, ask them on Twitter by applying the hashtag fixing bugs in democracy. So if you type fixing bugs in democracy, I'm monitoring that. Uh, you can also try the Zoom Q&A on here. And finally, uh, if you are very texty, then you can text questions to 929-242-9349. Again, that's a uh, text message to 929-242. 2429349 and we'll get to questions in a little bit. So if I can jump in, I had a few questions um, about how you did this and, and how you translated an issue that historically is very hard to get people uh, to engage in. They, they care about it, they understand something's wrong, but that's a big uh, difference from saying, I'm gonna sign something, I'm gonna join you. So in these town halls, how did you take an issue like gerrymandering, which most people don't know what it is, or if they know what it is, they think it always happens, nothing's gonna change. How did you speak to people uh, in a way that that issue gained greater meaning and, and sounded like something that could actually change? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and something that I think over time we evolved to figure out how to do even more and more effectively. In those town halls though, we really wanted to go back to basics. 
I think sometimes these issues can feel really unapproachable, especially if you didn't study politics before, or if you're trying to remember back to civics class, like it's like a very tiny footnote, or at least it was for me. And so we started with like, what the heck is redistricting in general? And what the heck is gerrymandering? What is a district? What lines are we talking about? I mean, that was one of the most confusing things at first when talking to a lot of people was like, we're not actually talking about every set of lines. Our governor is elected through a popular vote. Our senators are elected through a popular vote. But the state senate, the state house, our congressional members, those are the lines we're talking about. So going back to that, and then what we'd also do is we'd talk about, so what does that mean for Michigan? And in Michigan, we're a very purple state. About 50% of our residents vote for Democrats, about 50% vote for Republicans. They have for decades. The Democrats have gerrymandered the state and the Republicans have gerrymandered the state. So giving some of that history and then talking about what does this look like um, and talking about how it really impacts everybody was really important. Um, not only what is the vote discrepancy, but also what does incumbency look like? What are the issues that um, have been popular that have been ignored that might have their roots in gerrymandering? Talking about that. Then we talked about what does it look like in other states that don't redistrict in the way that we do? What is even possible? Trying to help people understand, like, what could it look like? And also get people comfortable with, like, this has actually not been done this only in this way um, forever. There's lots of other states who are doing it different ways who are getting a lot better results. So we highlighted six different states that had some form of not politicians drawing their lines. Uh, and then lastly, we ended with, and what can we do about it as citizens? Having the ballot initiative process, not everybody understands that or how it works. There's been lots of attempts at passing things that weren't through a constitutional amendment. It was through a statutory amendment where people got um, thrown off because the legislature could still basically edit the law and then change it. So a lot of people were concerned if I'm going to put my time and energy and money into this, like how do I know that we even have a chance of possibly winning? Uh, and so taking the time to do that was really important. And for the actual survey on how do we uh, talk to people and get their feedback on things. We asked them direct questions. Uh, it, it wasn't a short survey at all, but we'd have conversations and did a survey. I'm like, you know, do you like that politicians can draw the lines? How about registered lobbyists? Should people be required to have a high school diploma? When you think about representation, what are the types of issues that you want to make sure that your representative is thinking about when they're going to office? Um, our state capitals, Lansing, so like in Lansing and in Washington, D.C. Uh, and really kept the conversation going that way. Um, the other part that we focused on too, I, I think part of us plugging people in with where their skills were helped make the thought of getting involved in the political process a lot easier. I had so many people coming and saying, I've never done this before. I don't even know if I should be here. One of my favorite examples is we had a, a veterinarian who was like, I work weird hours. I've never done this before. I can only volunteer from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. Should I even be here? And I was like, well, being a veterinarian, you've gone to a lot of schools. So I bet you know how to do research. Would you be interested in helping us do, you know, research on other states and what happened when they changed the rules? And then you can just post it online at four in the morning. We don't care. We'll re I'll read it when I'm awake, which is not four in the morning. Well, it is four in the morning sometimes because I don't go to bed that early. But, you know, we'll all read it when we can. And it really helped ease people into that. And the other thing that I think is really important that I think um, whether it's working on redistricting or any other one of these democracy types of issues is even though it's super overwhelming to know that you need to gather 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures in 180 days or get 2.5 million voters to know what this is and want to vote on it, we broke it down into reasonable um, goals. So what we would say is, you know, okay, right now we don't have a million dollars, but there are over a thousand of us who are all saying we want to do this. And if each of us find four friends to donate $10, then we can actually get enough money to print our petitions. And that's the next most closest step that we need to do. Printing petitions cost $40,000 on their own. So, and for gathering signatures, you know, if we can get 3,000 of us to gather 10 signatures a week for, you know, only a couple weeks, we actually will gather enough signatures in more than enough time. We'll actually finish early. And by making it actually achievable, even though it sounded really big, because it was really big and it sounded really hard because it was really hard, but by breaking it down and really focusing on what's the next step and how do each of us individually contribute, that adds up to that bigger whole, was what really made the difference. And um, did you get, do you work with other organizations? I wrote, years ago, I wrote about the one man, one vote rulings in the early 60s of the Supreme Court and the politics. And what was notable was that issue got connected to civil rights organizations and to all the social justice struggles. And, and the key was showing if districts are drawn this way, 
you're never going to get progress on civil rights issues. And, and that becomes key. When you did this, did other organizations who saw the policy connections help out? Did they join you? Uh, or were you really working on your own? Yeah, eventually they did. You know, there were a lot of organizations that were working on redistricting before we even started. But I think because they were multi-issue organizations uh, and because Michigan is just, it's complicated. There's there's a lot of measures that have been started, whether redistricting or not, that failed. Um, I don't think anybody was really thinking about how do we really make sure that we change this law before 2020 because the next set of redistricting is happening in 2021. So at first, we actually got a bunch of pushback. A lot of organizations were like, hold on a second. You're only organizing online so far because we didn't even meet in person for the first four months. You know, you're like, like, sure, we've seen when people like like a post, but does that really actually amount to people volunteering? They were very skeptical that it did, even though we were seeing that every day. And another thing was a lot of those organizations were saying, you know, we've also talked about this issue for a long time, but we haven't seen any traction on it. We don't think the people of Michigan are going to ever care. So why would we waste our time and resources doing something like this? Uh, what we discovered pretty quickly and from hearing from other states who are giving us advice on how do you actually move the needle on gerrymandering was until people have something to vote on, you're going to reach some people, but a lot of people aren't going to take the time to pay attention because it doesn't feel as relevant to them yet. So when you have an active campaign, people are going to have to actually make a decision. That's how you can start moving the needle a lot. Um, eventually, though, a lot of those organizations, I think, saw that we were serious and that even though we started online and even though I was 27, we were still very professional, very organized, and they did become supportive. And they also saw that their issues really mattered, whether it was environmental or civil rights, um, you know, small businesses, too, who had uh, we have cherry farmers in Michigan and having to talk to different congressional members instead of being able to have one person who's really trying to champion their issue, that really resonated and we started to see across the state people helping others make the connection of, you know, it's not just Democrat and Republican uh, breakdown that happens when these lines are drawn in this way. It's actually our community's voice being able to be heard and our community being able to be prioritized. Uh, and uh, the, the Sierra Club is a great example where pretty early on, I think they have a really great volunteer base already where they, they have a lot of volunteers lot, do a lot of great work. And they immediately said, hey, here's how all of our issues translate into into geographic boundaries that we want to make sure that your representatives can, you can go and talk to them about. And so a lot of what you did was signature gathering and going to reach people. I read, uh, you know, your work went from sports events uh, to fairs and you were out there, you know, getting signatures with a clipboard. But the obvious question right now is, is here we are for a while, uh, locked down, communicating on social media, not able to do that one-on-one -on -one work that really matters still in politics and organizing. How are you, as someone who's been so successful at this, thinking now about how you could reimagine activism, at least for the time being in the near future, in this kind of virtual environment? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, that's the only way we were able to exist. Like, we would not have been able to be successful unless there was the internet and all these organizing tools and ability to connect to people. So I think as I think about it, right now is a great time to find other people who are passionate about the same thing that you want to do to, to make the world better. So making that Facebook post, quote unquote, or trying to go down the internet rabbit hole to find other people who are going to want to spend their free time volunteering to figure out how do we amend the state constitution to end gerrymandering, they are out there. And I think one of the things that I previously had thought, because I wasn't getting a lot of people responding to like other stuff I had posted, I think I felt really alone before. I kind of would like read or listen to the news and I was like, doesn't anybody care? Doesn't anybody care that the system is so screwed up? And that Facebook post totally changed how I looked at the world because all of a sudden I realized, yeah, actually a ton of people care. I just didn't know them. And we just weren't working together and we didn't have a mission together. So I think right now finding those people is probably somewhat easier to do or maybe have a little bit more time to, I'm not sure. The other thing I would say is, um, organizing there's so many free tools from like google suite where you can do google docs and or we use trello which is like just an online like posting board but i know there's like many others being able to figure out how can we collaborate what works 
um, is really important. And, and thankfully, the Internet allows, again, flexibility and schedule for when people can go and actually post things. And it also allows for, like, transparency. Being putting out there, like, what you're working on so other people can look at it, 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 it really makes a difference. Um, when it comes to actually gathering petitions and things, I mean, I, I think it's going to be very hard if you can't go into physical locations, but we did a thing called microcirculating where uh, we had like an instruction sheet for people and then they'd get a couple petitions and then they would just actually talk to their immediate family and gather those petitions and they'd see if any of those folks knew other folks who'd maybe just take it and do their immediate family um, and actually ended up gathering several thousand signatures, even though at first we're like, oh, this kind of seems like a waste of time. Uh, and right now, I mean, you'd have to figure out the mailing logistics of how do you get these to people or how can people request something. But your immediate network is really, uh, can be really powerful, especially, again, like each of us can do so much and talk to so many people. Um, so thinking about how do I talk to my immediate network, whether you live directly with them or it's an ask that you can make on your social media or as you're connecting over Zoom or whatever it is to say, you know, recently I've been volunteering to try and end gerrymandering in our state. And I know that sounds really weird, but actually it's really important right now to me because of whatever reason. I mean, right now the fact that it's a census year, redistricting is happening in 2021, those things are all in place. And I think being able to think creatively about how do we do that makes a lot of sense. The other thing I would say is, although the big obstacle totally was gathering a bunch of signatures and getting out the vote and writing constitutional language, the planning to do that really effectively took a ton of time. A ton of, like while we were writing the constitutional language, we also had hundreds of volunteers figuring out how are we gonna make sure people know the rules to gather signatures? Where are we gonna set up locations? How are we gonna like logistically handle mailing them across the state? And that's something that again, right now, you have so much time to connect and actually think about those details. You can be planning those documents, creating the training quizzes for people so that as soon as you are able to go and start gathering in those public spaces or you're able to have a little bit more freedom in the physical aspects of a campaign, you're very prepared and very ready to go do that. Katie, um, I should say we've actually got a bunch of questions, uh, great questions piled up in the uh, Zoom Q&A and some things are showing up on the Twitter feed. So let's try to be rapid fire because I want to really get to some of these really good That's questions. Good. Let me just try to, uh, I, I will just say that we're on with Katie Fahey, uh, Julian Zelazer and I are, are interviewing Katie. Uh, and I just want to in inject a quote here. Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, apparently your close buddy, uh, says, uh, here's a quote from Arnold. And I'm not even going to do his voice here. Uh, I'm, I'm, he says, uh, I'm inspired by the way you got involved and decided to do something. I always tell people not to just sit in front of their TV and complain, but to get out and do something because democracy is not just a spectator sport. I, I, I didn't do that. Um, but the idea, one thing I find really comforting about communications from voters, not politicians, is that the communications are kind of fun. You know, like I don't get asked for money very often by voters, not politicians. I, uh, I, I get told the news. I, um, last February, I got a Valentine from voters, not politicians. It said, be my valid line. Uh, I just want to point out that during your petition drive, uh, one woman who uh, was a volunteer with VNP collected 80 signatures at a highway rest stop while dressed up as the gerrymandered 11th District of Michigan. Okay, so I just, that's brilliant. Okay, I just, I just say that's brilliant. So uh, we're pretty soon, I have to get to questions, but I just wanted to just uh, turn a little bit to, um, to your new gig. Uh, where for a couple of years you've been working at The People, which is um, uh, your co-founder and executive director of that. And I want to talk about the idea of, of basically what you're looking to do with the lessons from Michigan and exactly uh, how these, this Michigan experience is turning into reform nationwide. Can you just talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, yeah, and I'll tie in the Arnold comment, which is so cool. Um, I, I think one of the best things about me making this Facebook post for, for it being me individually is like, I totally knew I didn't know what I was doing. And I wasn't afraid to say that. <laughs> um, and I wasn't afraid to say, you know, like, hey, we've got to figure this out. But our constitution gives us the right to figure that out and to try and make this change. So let's figure out how we can actually navigate and do that. I, I don't take obstacles. I always saw it as an opportunity for like, okay, we've got to brainstorm and crowdsource. How do we get over this? And at first, Especially, like we ended up doing all these things innovatively and accidentally. I had no idea that that wasn't how you did a campaign in many ways. Like we didn't know that campaigns don't often go to rest stops uh, on the day before Thanksgiving. Um, it's one of the busiest days in Michigan to 
for traffic and rest stops. And we actually talked with the folks who work at those and who clean the rest stops and asked them which ones were the busiest so that we could figure out how do we make sure that we go there and talk to the most voters. Uh, but when we were first starting, there really wasn't anybody who would help us. There were folks who had done this before, but a lot of them, especially because we were just quote unquote regular citizens or we were just from the internet, didn't feel like, I don't, I, I mean, I guess, that we were worth their time or that maybe they felt as a threat. And so something that really stuck with me was how many tools and things we had to create from scratch, whether it was a database on collecting signatures or figuring out how to write a guide for how to gather signatures because all the rules were really complicated, um, figuring out that survey for asking people about questions related to writing constitutional language. And while we were doing it, all of us kept just saying like, it is already so hard to do this and building all this from scratch makes it even harder. And let's work really hard right now so that the next people who want to do something really great in our state don't have to work quite as hard so that they can actually have something to build off of. So once, um, and when you make a Facebook post uh, that ends up turning into a, a political movement, you get a decent amount of press too. It makes a very snappy headline, which is really cool for us. I mean, we got featured in the New York Times. And then what was really cool to me was we had all these people from across the country reaching out and saying, I never knew I was allowed to do anything about gerrymandering. I'm so excited, and I can't believe that you guys are, like, having all these people are so excited. Can you help me? And at the time, I was like, we're still trying to win this campaign. Like, I don't even know if what we're doing is doing it well, but, like, give me a second, and once we're done, of course I will. And the people, the thing that – um started out of Voters Not Politicians. Voters Not Politicians is very focused just in Michigan. The people is trying to take the lessons that we learned, not only about organ, um, about gerrymandering, but also about organizing and help like pay it forward to the rest of the world and say, if you're working on systemic democracy reform issues, we want to try and help. We want to try and help give you some of those basic organizing tools. We want to help get you connected to the people you're supposed to know. We were starting, like, I didn't know the Brennan Center. I didn't know, you know, who to talk to at Common Cause who would help on redistricting. I didn't know you, Sam. Like, I, I didn't know millionaires who would want to invest in a campaign ran by citizens. And that was such a huge obstacle. It, it, we, all, we always talk about that for like, you got, it's who you know when you're like trying to get a job. It was totally that way with working with the political system. Because people didn't view us as important, we got ignored. So now that we have some of those connections, we want to help other people who are in the spot that we were get those. And then also that Facebook post part, we want to help other people find people who are passionate about the same thing they are to just help get connected and have a platform for folks to do that. Um, so really taking those lessons and helping people on all kinds of uh, governmental reform, gerrymandering, uh, primaries, voting systems, all of that. Any, uh, just I've got about 10 questions here before flipping it over for, to Julian for anything. I'm just going to try to extract some uh, super short bits of advice, sort of micro advice. Sure. Can you give us some haiku on, uh, for instance, let's see, Judy wants to know, how'd you get people to even show up at town halls in the first place? So what's, what's the strategy for getting people to come out? Yep. Call local radio, especially in rural places, local and radio. let them know and actually have them showing up mean something meaningful. So for us, it was your input is going to be used in how we're going to write this language. That's, that's like not something you normally get asked. That's tough because local papers are drying up and it's really hard to get uh, local interest. And so that's getting harder and harder. Um, tell me about, um, let's see. So Steve Huff wants to uh, sort of has a similar question to how one organizes or promotes the town hall. Um, like, so it sounds like, uh, sounds like radio is a good way to do that. And that's, and that's pretty radio. Cheap, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, because a lot of radio stations that still want to do local stories or they'll cover local events that are happening. So this is a local event that's happening. And so, and for us being able to roll out doing the entire state at once, so we didn't just launch with only doing one event in one city. We launched, uh, when we first launched, actually, we were only doing eight, and then it was a really popular idea. So uh, we ended up doing 33. But uh, being able to say that and say, hey, this is a statewide tour, we're coming to you, that seemed to work pretty well. We also found retired journalists who were volunteers of ours, and they were very comfortable mm -hmm. calling up radio stations or newspapers or finding a lot of communities have local community calendars. The other thing I'd say is, since we're all online again, find local Facebook groups or, or the different neighborhood groups where you, people would probably already be interested. 
and then try and connect with them and, and see if they'll share and talk about it. And again, you have to get your messaging right on why is this even worth my time? Why am I showing up to this town hall? If you're just going to talk to me about something I already know about, that's not important. So what does it mean? Is there an election coming up and there's an important issue? Is, are you asking for their feedback? Um, what other critical parts are there? I think that another, uh, maybe a more detailed look at some of how these things get done can be uh, gotten by watching the film Slay the Dragon, which is out and it's just, uh, just out from participant media. And Jim wants to know how can one watch it? Jim, the way to watch Slay the Dragon is to go to slaythedragonfilm.com and at Slay the Film, Slay the Film, Slay the, don't do that, slaythedragonfilm.com, uh, you can um, get Katie's story, and Jim also wants to know uh, how other states can do what's happening in Michigan. Uh, Jim, you can read about that at that site. You can also read about reform by going to gerrymander.princeton.edu, and you can hear about things like the petition drive in Arkansas. You can hear about efforts in uh, Oregon, in Nevada. Uh, uh, they're working really hard in Illinois, in Oklahoma, New Mexico, uh, reform is busting out in the states where it's allowed. So, uh, so uh, that's the answer for you, Jim. Um, let's see. So let, I'm just looking at all these really terrific questions. Here's an interesting question. Back to Julian's point about um, coronavirus and, and doing these things online. Uh, Samuel Fieldman wants to know, how, she, how does your organization, how do organizations deal with the drawing up of small dollar donations? Uh, he's, uh, he's national counsel for a, for a grassroots PAC, and he's looking to support uh, his members and their communities but they don't know how to stay afloat financially. Are you in touch with organizations trying to do that? Yeah, yeah, we'd be happy to help um, in whatever way we can. And actually for us, we didn't have major dollars donated to us until a year and a half into the campaign. I think the key to helping people understand why is, is helping people understand why they need to donate. Us being transparent with what were we trying to pay for and why and in what time frame, most organizations don't do. Yes, maybe you get a fundraising email that's like, we have to defeat this bill right now. But that isn't, hey, in order to get a law firm, we have to put a $100,000 retainer in the bank, like give them a $100,000 retainer and we ha have to do that in the next 60 days. Like we were literally that transparent. And I know mass email communication maybe isn't the best way, but if you do like individual volunteer briefings, um, or if there's a way to make sure that like really you're in more inner circle, but who are going to be the people who are already invested with their time and energy, that was really key. The other thing I would say is try to think about the things that you're doing that maybe you have super qualified volunteers to be able to do. It does take work to make sure you've outlined a project and that you can get somebody onboarded to your practices, but we didn't have any paid staff until the very, very end of the campaign when we could finally afford it. Like it, we had people who did, uh, uh, digital advertising for Ford Motor Company who were volunteering with us to want to end gerrymandering. Well, although they hadn't worked on a political campaign, having that type of experience for a major company translated extremely easily into trying to help with the campaign. And I think with other organizations, if there's other ways you can do that. We have a grant committee with the people and we have some amazing volunteers, especially some who had just retired. They're trying to look at how can they give back. who are willing to do that. But I think small dollar donations, if you have a good brand, you know, we did t-shirts. Everybody wanted a t-shirt because they wanted to be able to show like what they were passionate about. That worked really well. And they understood that, you know, that donation helped fund the campaign and then being able to also be really transparent about what the money's going towards, why, and, and give people a chance to want to invest in you. And I think for monthly donations, I know for us, that helps us sustain our programming over time, letting people know that again, every, every monthly donor helps us be able to budget more accurately. And if you want this really great Thing that we're working on to continue that will help. Did you do you back to uh, your previous campaign with redistricting? Uh, you're so successful, and it's an amazing, inspiring story. Was there though something that you did that, thinking back, you wish you had done differently? Is there a lesson you learned from that that maybe you're going to use now that you could share with us? Um, I. I've been asked that a lot, and actually I don't really think there's a lot, which maybe is not the right answer. I'm sure we could have done things differently. I mean, I think we learned some great lessons about what tools to use when. Like, in the beginning, we should <laughs> have had, like, a, a wave. We should have had some kind of volunteer management system, but we didn't know that at the time. So, I mean, if we would have known that earlier, for sure. But I really think we did a great job operating on our values and trying to work as quickly as we could. Um, and I think we're taking a lot of those lessons and I think the things that we learned we're, we're moving forward with too. What pressures, uh, oh, I have a follow-up uh, that just came through from Jeffrey. 
Um, were you working in full-time job and sustainability while working on the campaign? So how did you kind of balance the training? <laughs> from work to yes. When we were first starting, especially, I was working full time, attempting to get my MBA, and then running to improv troops, which is like improv comedy, whose line is it anyways, or like Saturday Night Live stuff. We were running a festival. I'm like a person who does a lot anyways, and, and trying to have a life, you know, be a 20-something. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so part of my motivation, even for me, I'm like, okay, if I'm going to take so much of the very little free time that I have to work on this, I want to make sure that we're not compromising our integrity. I'm so sick of hearing about organizations saying one thing and doing another. I'm so sick of like politicians who do that. And I just want like something that I can believe in and actually feel really good about. Um, and that was a lot of motivation. Uh, slowly, I stopped my MBA and I quit my improv troops. But for my job, I stayed full time um, right up through August of 2018. Uh, and that's when I kind of had a conversation. We the, it was the New York Times, actually, they were calling, and they said, you know, we really have to get, you know, a quote before 3 p.m., and I was like, well, um, I'm at work, and I have a really important meeting, so I can't, and so that was kind of a moment for me where then I had to take a step back, but, and, and there were thousands of us. I mean, there were probably active day-to-day -day at least 5,000 people every single day working to try and make sure that this got passed, which is really inspiring. Can I ask what you're, you're I'm, I'm listening to you. And you have two different messages of politics in your story. One is back to Flint, a kind of frustration with the inability of politicians to do things, a, a kind of argument about gridlock and, and even corruption. And yet you have this other part of your story, which is the opposite. It's you can get involved, you can actually change things that the system does change. I mean, you actually did something concrete uh, in Michigan. And so it's a very different kind of story. How has all of this, all the things you're doing, how has it changed your views of politics? And kind of where are they now and how you think about it? Yeah, I, when we first won, I was amazingly happy and excited. So I don't want this to come off the wrong way. But I actually was really mad, too. We had been told by everyone, by media, by nonprofits, by politicians, everyone, that this was impossible. And also, I had heard excuses for decades on why we can't end gerrymandering in Michigan and why it was too hard. And so the fact that we could figure it out and that we could do it was really exciting, but it also, like, kind of made me mad because I felt like everybody was not actually trying as hard as they could before. And maybe it was timing, and I'm sure there was aspects of that. But I think in one way, I... I now look at politics as if I'm hearing a lot of excuses, I don't think that person is trying very hard. Like, I, I don't think that person's being real with how do we actually solve this. And, and I think what I realize is that a lot of leaders don't often trust people to understand how complicated a situation might be. It, it's much easier to just have a talking point or to make a black and white argument instead of a very gray argument around, hey, here's the reality of how we do this. That's something we did really differently. Every obstacle we were coming up with, I tried to go to everybody and kind of say, hey, here's where we're at. Here's the information we have. What should we do about this? What other information do we need? How are we going to solve this? And people were hungry for that. They were hungry for, like, an answer that felt real. Like, trying to, like, I never said we don't need millions of dollars because to get on TV, we needed millions of dollars. But, you know, that became then a goal that we could try and achieve. The other thing I think, too, is, I, for me, I had recently graduated when all of this started, and I didn't really, like, all the laws I was seeing passed in Michigan, especially on the environmental side, I, I did not feel like this was a state that I wanted to live in. I was like, what is wrong with us? What is wrong with the people of Michigan? And I was having a really bad day during the campaign, and normally in those moments, again, I would have felt kind of, like, alone or what, not to be dramatic, but, you know, a bad day. You're allowed to feel alone on a bad day. And I started then thinking about how, I could think of all 83 counties in Michigan and how we had people in all of them dedicating their time and their energy and their money and their creativity towards trying to make the world better, trying to make Michigan better, trying to make elections fair for the next decade of Michiganders and the decade after that and the decade after that with no promise of guarantee, with only everybody telling us it was impossible, yet day in and day out they were working towards making our state a better state for everybody. And I found that so inspiring and it really brought me back into like, 
it's not the people of our state who are screwed up. It's that the incentives right now in our political system are very skewed and they don't allow for accountability. And if we could have accountability, I feel like the people would be holding our politicians more accountable. Um, so I think it's changed in that way. And I think you know, that this is not a quick answer. <laughs> but the last part, I think, too, is for me, because we were starting it in that way. And I was like, if I'm going to be volunteering, I want to be doing this in a way that like is the way it's quote unquote supposed to be done. I think it was a test for me on does is democracy even worth fighting for? And we were fighting for redistricting, but the way that we were organizing, because it reflected the democratic process, because it was bringing everybody to the table and it was about compromise and it was about how do we work for on behalf of the other people in our state, not only the ones now, but future generations of voters. How are what we are doing right now, how are we going to take that as seriously as possible to do this? That to me was if we ended up failing, you know, maybe democracy is dead and it doesn't really work and like then I'll like stop bothering all my friends to register to vote. But it was the exact opposite. We had so many people who for the first time in their lives felt like, oh my gosh, I'm so much more powerful than I knew I was. We had over 17 people run for local office, all because they had volunteered with us and they saw that all those excuses they were telling themselves on how they weren't qualified or it really shouldn't be them, all those kind of went away. And we had other people start ballot initiatives after this at the city level for redistricting. There's a group working on ranked choice voting. Like to see all of those things that change just because we said, no, you are invited into this process and no, we are all allowed to try to do this together, um, really, really made a difference and it's really strengthened uh, my opinion on how the system right now, it needs experts, it needs people who study things, but it also actually needs to take the time to reach out to the people who are impacted by these decisions. We have to hold people accountable to making sure that citizens are consulted before laws are passed because we are the ones who live with the consequences. I think one difficulty is, um, I'm gonna turn now to some pretty state specific questions. We've got a bunch of people from around the country who have pretty specific questions. Uh, I wanna turn now to, um, uh, to kind of start from what you're talking about here. I've read that, um, that the problem is that individuals have no idea what they can do, right? This is, uh, and, and I think you start from this point of people not knowing what to do. And I think I wanna to turn to some uh, listener questions that speak to that because they want to know, um, I wanna start from your new gig at The People, trying to help people or trying to help citizens organize. And I'm gonna to turn to a question. This is a question from North Carolina. And this has to do with exactly how can uh, us as little individuals turn into building something bigger. And Jennifer Bremer from North Carolina wants to know, uh, she's got some real nuts and bolts questions here. And, and, and I, want, I, I told you I wanted a short answer. Good luck with this one. Uh, <laughs> what did the management structure look like? Could you provide specifics about your core team, how that was structured, functions and regions? Like how do you like build totally. a team? And she's, you know, I know Jennifer a little bit. Um, and, and she's really interested in redistricting North Carolina. They don't have an initiative process uh, and they're trying to organize down there. So can you just talk a little bit about how one would do that? Yeah, yeah. And um, if you later want to go to the people.org, we can continue this conversation in much more depth. But oh, so you're for helping us, people organize locally? Uh, like if, if, yeah. if, they get, if North Carolina comes to you and says, we want to get it going, then, then you and all your buddies at the people.org can do that? Yeah, yeah, and we have some tools and stuff that are really easy for us to push forward. We're happy to come do like okay. consulting or whatever, like hop on call. So the people.org, people.org slash volunteer probably is a great way to get connected. Yeah. Anyway, um, so nuts and bolts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think when it comes to organizational structure, decision making processes are really important and who's figuring out where the plan is going next. So knowing like, how are we going to measure this? What are our goals? And, and who is making sure that we are, who's the facilitator of the decision making process? And one of the questions we asked ourselves constantly was, a, we called it the chain of communication. I, I mean, I think an organization's probably the chain of command, but that didn't sound as good to us. We wanted to know every single person who is a volunteer of our organization, do they know who is telling them how they can be helping? So who's telling them what their volunteer role is? And who do they go to um, with questions and feedback? So if we couldn't answer that question for any of the volunteers, then we need to figure that out. And we need to figure out the next regional structure. For it, it really depends on like what type of thing you're doing. So like our policy committee had a different structure than our field committee. But we did divide the state into 14 different regions. 
And those regions would have basically like some kind of like captain who reported to a wider director. And then there was like a statewide team for each of these committees, whether it was education or fundraising. Uh, canvassing was the largest one. That's where most of our volunteers were with gathering signatures and door knocking. But um, each of those had reporting structures, regularly scheduled meetings and communications that were really important. So again, I can help provide more details after that, but I really think you have to know who is helping people understand what, how they can be contributing and how are you make, guaranteeing that that communication, those questions are being answered. And if that person doesn't know the answer, who do they go to? And if that person doesn't know the answer, who do they go to? So that you can get that answer going all the way back down. Um, and where you can put things online for people to connect. Okay, for the redistricting, did you want me to answer that part too or no? Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, although I'm gonna okay. I'm about to come at you with another redistricting question, but you can go ahead. Sure. Okay. Legislative states, I mean, I think if there's a way and any kind of will to pass a law that can help you either when it comes to redistricting, I, I see three main ways that you can have a better system. Who is drawing the lines? So if you can change who is in charge of drawing the lines. How are the lines being drawn? Can you strengthen the criteria so that they can not be drawn based on political, um, uh, giving a disproportionate advantage to one political party or the other? And the third is, what does the process actually look like? Can you make it so that any redistricting meeting has to follow an Open Meetings Act? It has to have the public at it, where the data that's being used to draw those maps has to be made public immediately. Look at those types of laws. See if you can change it there. The other thing too is if you don't have enough time to change the law, look at who's being elected before those lines are drawn in 2021 and ask them their stances. But also you can go and give public testimony um, on how your community should be represented. And that's really important because if those lines don't end up being drawn in a way that reflects all of the public testimony that's given, that can potentially help a court case and the legislators will have to answer, okay, you drew the maps actually in the complete opposite direction. Why would you do that when you're the people were saying this? So there's a lot more. And, and also the census, make sure people fill out the census. But I think, I'll yeah, take your next question. And, relevant relevant yeah. to Jennifer's point, uh, since she's in North Carolina, uh, one of the difficulties with public input there was uh, that the legislators would just cut right through uh, different regions in North Carolina. There's a region called the Sand Hills that got cut in half. Uh, I'll just interject that my team at Princeton's uh, got a project going called representable.org. And representable is a software tool to let people do exactly what Katie's talking about to, uh, to weigh in and uh, talk about their regions of uh, communities of interest. So while we're on the topic of, of uh, so that would be a tool that could be used, we hope in the coming year or so. And that's an example of uh, a tool that will perhaps be put in the right hands and do some good work. So here's some more questions. These, I'm gonna do the hard ones here. These are states that don't have a, an initiative process. Rawlison has a couple of questions about that kind of thing. Rawlison wants to know, okay, what about Wisconsin where we've seen now uh, some pretty uh, egregious problems with, uh, with coronavirus fears and an election being ordered by a court to take place despite the coronavirus fears. Uh, courts seem to be in some ways unhelpful and there's no initiative process. So what could be done in, in Wisconsin? Rawlison wants to know. So Wisconsin has some great groups right now that are working on this. And one of the things that they've been doing is they've actually been trying to pass county resolutions that end up saying that that this county and the, the people in it want an independent citizens redistricting commission. And then they send that order to the governor, all of the, uh, like the secretary of state um, and the attorney general, as well as all of the representatives in Wisconsin to let them know. They have almost every single county saying this. and. Yes, that doesn't force anybody to address the issue, but it does make it one where then you can say, okay, if 100% of the population of the state is saying this and you're doing the opposite, why are you doing that? And maybe a primary attack, even if you're going to have another Republican or another Democrat running in that seat, that primary opponent can go and, and be asking those questions too and maybe challenge someone and maybe get elected based on wanting to do redistricting. Um, in Wisconsin too, I believe that there's talk of doing a kind of side independent commission that's going to try and shame people into, into having more fair maps too. I think the governor is trying to help in that way. Um, and that's important. It's important to make sure that like that can be highlighted. The other thing I would say too is that businesses are impacted by this as well when lines are just drawn to benefit Democrats or Republicans. If you can get some business voices talking about this, I think that's important. The other thing I would say is now more than ever, doesn't Wisconsin feel like a place where you wish you had a ballot initiative process? And are there some legislators or again, some businesses who might be able to put some pressure on to even start talking about that idea so that in the future you could get those kinds of changes. And I just want to 
even though public testimony might end up being ignored. I just want to emphasize that the federal Supreme Court said that the state level Supreme Courts need to be handling topics of partisan redistricting. And if a lawsuit is being brought in Wisconsin or another state, and you have thousands of people who turned out and who are saying, this is how the lines should be drawn, this is how our lives are being impacted with the, the current set of districts, that will be brought up probably as evidence in those court cases to be able to make a stronger case saying, we don't think these lines were drawn to actually reflect the voters of Wisconsin. We think these lines were drawn in a gerrymandered way. There's some crazy stuff happening in Wisconsin where the legislators apparently on the Republican side are thinking about uh, maybe even passing a map as a resolution rather than a law. And it, it almost seems that one might actually want to put pressure on the state Supreme Court and get them to administer the law in a precedent that goes back to 1964. And so at some of, I mean, those are elective offices and one of them was up for, office, one up for election this Tuesday. And so one possibility there would be to apply pressure as distasteful as it may seem to judges and to the state Supreme Court and say, you know, do not let the legislature uh, run roughshod over the executive branch over the voters of the state. Let me and I just that. echo that like, even when it comes to Supreme Court or whatever, like, like, Oftentimes politicians feel like nobody's paying attention so they can get away with it that way too. And for us, yes. for our Supreme Court, we had a Supreme Court case. We actually filled the entire court and we had a rally of 300 people outside while hearing that case. And one of the judges I got to talk to afterwards and they mentioned that the only time that the Michigan Supreme Court was full that entire session, all of 2018, was that day. And they mentioned and said, don't think we didn't notice. It was very clear that people were actually paying attention and that this was an issue about voters. And, and I, again, I think it's so easy, especially when you see all of the, the backroom dealings and stuff to be really discouraged, but people power matters, showing up, making sure voices are there matters. And that isn't just complaining to your friends on Facebook or on social media, like physically showing up, physically showing up to offices, showing up to hearings, that's what matters. Because it is noticeable in Michigan that there were judges who were uh, thought to be conservative or partisan uh, at least one or maybe two of them uh, switched sides and flipped his vote uh, to be sympathetic to voting rights. And I'm interested to hear that. And it was, in Wisconsin, that's almost certainly going to be very important in the, in the next couple of years. Let me turn to Virginia now. And, and I, at some level, I, now I've, I've, I've mentioned a political party, and so I've sort of got myself into this situation. So we've got Dela and Rollison again, both asking about Virginia. Let me combine their questions. Um, let me just, uh, actually, uh, not Sorry, I'm just like synthesizing questions here on the fly here. Let me read two questions that I think are relevant. Dela uh, uh, wants to know, hi, Katie. She says, can you talk about how conversations do or don't change when you're fighting gerrymandering from the left, left versus right? And she basically, I think, wants to know how one makes arguments to conservatives against gerrymandering. Let me combine that with another question. Uh, it's uh, here. Uh, Pamela wants to know uh, advice and tips on how to keep focus on nonpartisan aspects and extricate, extricate yourself from partisan bickering that can ensue. And so the question here is how to cross the aisle, how to get away from party labels, and there's a focus on Virginia. Yeah, uh, and I wrote an op-ed for Virginia when they were voting on this, so that might like provide some more context there. Virginia, you know, the Democrats had the year before been excited to pass redistricting reform because they didn't have control of the House or Senate, and then in their election they did get control, and they, they almost didn't pass an amendment that now will be up to the voters to decide on whether they want an independent commission. Um, and I think holding people accountable to sticking with what they said was fine a year ago when they had less of an um, advantage it is really important. Uh, I think when we talk about gerrymandering, some of the easiest stats to look at are this many votes were cast for Democrats or this many votes were cast for Republicans and this many seats were allocated to Democrats or these many seats were allocated to Republicans. That's the horse race talk. And it's actually not what moves voters. It moves some voters, but they tend to be just some of the most partisan people who are paying attention anyways. And what really moves voters though is going back to like what gets missed when our districts are drawn for political advantage instead of being drawn to represent communities. When, when, uh, what do you care if your demo, uh, if your neighbor is a Democrat or Republican when your school system is failing and both of your kids are attending that school system? No, you care about your school actually being fixed. That's the real life aspects of politics and what gets lost, even if, let's say, the person that you like is elected into office. And I think being able to always bring it back to that, being able to bring it back to like, we live in a Democratic Republic. My vote is supposed to be cast 
so that I have somebody who actually represents me. And right now this person doesn't represent me, not just from a political standpoint, but because only half of my city is in this line. When you take the maps and you look at them, not showing the partisan data, but just showing the cities, people who live in those cities are like, why the heck would these, these cities have nothing in common? Why, why are we being placed together? And that's when it gets real for us. We had teams all across the state, and we would have every single, because a map is gerrymandered across the whole state. It's not just gerrymandered one or two districts. So we'd have every single district people talking about the real-life consequences that comes into that point. The other thing I would say is that, you know, so there's an argument to be made on, like, this is a foundational building block of democracy, and we really need to make sure that this can be trusted. I think even talking about trust in political office right now is huge. I think politicians feel that. They every day are getting lots of harsh feedback um, from people around the anger of of, of politics. Um, but the other thing too is is getting that representation. And what if the demographics are shifting? So not every state in Virginia. I mean, that's a really strong conclusion. Like like literally, the demographics are shifting. Who's voting? What ways shifted? And the Republicans did lose power. And one of the reasons the Republicans earlier had said, yeah, okay, let's look at this redistricting thing, is they knew that was a possibility. And they knew, like, okay, well, if somebody else is in charge, are we going to like what's being done to us to happen to us? So that, like, golden rule of, like, do unto your neighbor as you want done unto yourself or whatever. Like, that's a real argument that can be made, but it often has to be made um, in a state where, where it seems like it's a real risk. The there other thing I would say... Fear. There has to be some fear of yeah. getting stuck on the other end of things. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you can show that. I mean, you can show how many people are passionate about the issue. And even if you can't do the party fear, the thing you could maybe try and do, which which doesn't necessarily help the people in office, but I think there's an argument for at least raising excitement from one side of the aisle versus the other, is um, that uh, uh, incumbents, uh, gerrymandering protects incumbents. So you can't get newer people into office, can't get younger or more diverse people into office, even if it's from the same political party. One of the things that you see in the political science data of once you get more of an independent commission and you don't have the politician drawing the lines for the district they're about to run in, is that you get newer people into office because they no longer are able to like find where the person's running against them and like draw them out of the district. Um, and I had one other point. Oh, the other thing too is like, this polls really well, but also if you just talk to your friends and neighbors like about either money and politics or like, do you feel like your representative should be working on behalf of you? Everybody thinks that. And gerrymandering makes it so that, let's say again, I'm a Republican, I'm in a Republican district. The thought of my representative working harder for lobbyists or special interests and working hard for me, is still very unappealing. And I think redistricting can make the argument too that if it's a guaranteed outcome that this person is going to be elected once they make it past the primary. Are they really spending all their time trying to deliver results for you, or are they in somebody else's pocket? And that, in Michigan, especially resonated. Nobody trusted politicians. Nobody felt like anybody was working on behalf of them. Everybody was kind of frustrated with the status quo, even if they were blaming Democrats or blaming Republicans. That concept of, like, I'm not happy, government's broken, this is a way to get at that, this is a, a way to drain the swamp, a way to have the political revolution, that really seemed to add up. Could I ask if someone's listening to this and uh, they're hearing about the potential for a really messy election in November, if this is all happening, and they're hearing discussions of the need for election reform to mail in ballots and early red, you know, early voting, all of this, and then they're hearing it's being blocked and uh, there's a lot of opposition. What's a very practical thing for that person listening who's not in politics, they're just angry. Uh, and they want to do something like you felt when you started, what would you tell them right now they should do to try to make this, make this different in November? I think looking at and digging into the details of your state, does our state have a plan for November? If not, what should the plan be? Let's, and Vote at Home Institute is like a great, like one of those resources, there's many resources out there that really go state by state and say, hey, here's the best practices, here's what you can do. But I really think getting informed and digging into the, the details of what would this look like if it was a perfect solution is really important because then you can be a really strong advocate. Because a lot of your friends and neighbors right now are going to be thinking about that, but they might not have the, the time or they might not be on this call, so they might not be thinking about, okay, what does it really mean, though, to have a guaranteed safe election? What are the complications with that? And then taking that information and being able to go and talk to the representatives that your tax dollars pay for, your Secretary of State, your tax dollars pay for, your congressional member, your taxpayers, 
dollars pay for? You have every single right to be asking these questions. And I think if you can make it a popular idea and you talk about, hey, it seems like, yes, our state is going to be um, so in Michigan, we just passed no reason absentee voting. So before you had to like have a reason if you uh, wanted an absentee ballot, now you don't. That's great, but not all of my friends know how to request an absentee ballot. So I think one of the best things I could probably do is, okay, I'm going to figure out how to request an absentee ballot and then make sure all of my friends and family know that and figure out who else needs to know that. I'd say a similar thing for your state too. If it's going well, figure out those small details that not everybody has the time because they're busy, they're trying to figure out how to get a new job, they're trying to take care of kids, whatever. Do the hard work of figuring out those answers and then make it easy for other people. And if your state isn't prepared, figure out what is the thing that could be changed, one of the biggest things. Maybe they don't have enough funding. Maybe they're going to charge people their own postage if they're going to mail in results. Find that and make it loud because a lot of other people are going to want to um, be talking about that. And I would also say don't make it political. Make it about this is human health and human safety. This is not Democrat, Republican. Any elected official should, we should have the expectation that they are working on behalf of all of us. So elected official, I'm going to treat you like you are going to be, you know, looking out for all of us, but that means that this action should be happening, um, whatever that may be. And I know it's a little vague of an answer, but I think in each state you probably have something that you can either be raising more awareness on or be making sure your state's more prepared on. I think the difficulty right now in our federalist system, increasingly national uh, politicians are, are not really either in a position to or don't want to help. And so I think increasingly one needs to go local and go state by state. Uh, I know that a number of uh, listeners on the Zoom th thread and also on Twitter are asking what can they do either themselves at home or, uh, or uh, either giving money or so on. I'm just gonna name a couple of organizations and Katie, if you wanna throw in one. Um, uh, Sean wants to know what are some organizations that are doing good anti-gerrymandering and vote access work generally I'm just going to name a couple of possibilities, uh, Sean. Uh, Common Cause does good work and they really work all over the nation. There are regional organizations like the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. If, um, if you want to know about state by state, and you really got to look, go local, um, gerrymander.princeton.edu uh, gerrymander has reforms, uh, a reforms page where you can uh, read about that. And finally, I think there's some really good state by state re resources uh, that this new film, slaythedragonfilm.com. Uh, I believe it's slaythedragonfilm.com. They actually have a state-by-state -state resource for, um, for uh, how to work in your own state. And I think it's really critical to work locally to work on these things. And so much of what Katie's talking about today, I think is working locally. Hey, Katie, I wanted to end with a question that's totally different from these other ones. And I, I just want to come back to the fact that uh, you graduated from Aquinas College in Grand Rapids. And, uh, and I wanted to talk about that just a little bit as our last question. Um, it's a Dominican liberal arts college. They weave Catholic social teaching into the curriculum. And I want to hear you talk about uh, making a difference. I want to talk, I want to hear a little bit about what they taught you, what they, what came up with uh, in the curriculum at Aquinas College that maybe is relevant to what you do now. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I love that, by the way. Uh, feels relevant on Good Friday for anybody who celebrates that. But um, We're recording on Good Friday. Uh, good point. Yeah. Uh, so I think with the liberal arts education in general, and I'd say this about sustainable business too, there's an emphasis on learning like just enough about every single topic that you can like hopefully make connections and connect the dots and like also help people with really highly specified skills talk to each other. Um, that was one of my biggest jobs in sustainability was like, okay, how do we make this goal about carbon emissions relevant to the marketing department? Like, and how do we make it relevant to the, uh, like who we buy our groceries from? Like that kind of thing. Uh, and, and the liberal arts college, I mean, I think it gave me enough information so that I knew, I knew that we needed to do education. I knew we needed a policy. I knew like all those different pieces. And then I also knew that like every one of those pieces was really important. And that in order to achieve like this overall goal, if we didn't have any of those pieces, we probably weren't going to be successful. Even if one part maybe like feels more important or whatever, like actually every single person donating and taking their time, whether it's cutting the clipboards or putting in the check numbers or helping write constitutional language, all of those were absolutely critical and able in being able to be successful. I think the other thing too was like the Catholic social teaching aspect is, is a lot about like, if you can do good, uh, like, how are you doing good? And how are you, how are you helping the world? And I know that sounds like hokey or whatever, but I think I thought about so that a lot. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, yeah, a lot of religions are. And, 
And, um, and I think a lot of just like world mantras and, and philosophies come back to kind of, a, you know, we're connected, we're a wider being. And I think that was relevant because it just felt like, you know, with Flint in particular, I knew too much to do nothing. Like I, like I knew too much about the details that how systemically like our government had taken away voters options and that our government had made these choices for these people who then now have entire generations of their own families poisoned. Like I, I knew that like knowing that much, I couldn't do nothing. I had to do something. I had to at least try to give back. And I wanted to try and do that in the way that like my skills maybe leaned up towards. And that sense and that sense of community, that sense of it being about the greater good, not being about, oh, okay, I vote this way, so I want to make this better for all the people who vote this way. I think fundamentally that was really important. It came back to, like, this is our country that we live in. This is a community that we live in. We are looking out for each other, and we are trying to make a world where, you know, we're able to continuously look out for each other. That isn't often at the root of our politics right now. I think our politics right now tends to be like, we, when we finally got a fundraising, uh, this is a story to emphasize the point I'm trying to make. When we finally could afford a fundraising consultant, the first piece of advice we got was, who's your enemy? Because every single email you send needs to be attacking them because those are the emails that make the most money. And it just made this like light bulb go off in my head where I was like, okay, so anybody running for office, if that's the first piece of advice they get, how do we ever expect them to compromise with the other party with the other person who does still end up getting elected by the other people who live in this state. How do we ever expect them to actually operate that way? Because they're either lying to the people they're asking for money from, or they're making a promise basically to never compromise or try to like exist with people who think differently, which I just thought was crazy. So I think when our campaign started emphasizing, actually, no, this isn't about D's and R's. This is about us as voters. This is about this fundamental right and being able to get rid of this conflict of interest between politicians choosing their own voters. It, it allowed people to have that wider sense of community, even if maybe their original reason for volunteering was maybe more partisan or less. And I think it's also the thing that made us all want to try so hard is because you felt connected and you felt kind of like that, that wider sense of community that I think I was taught about too, that there's like a spirituality to these kinds of things that like, it can be fun. You're reminding me of, uh, Back in the 60s, during the civil rights movement, Catholic priests, both in the United States and then later we find it in other Latin American countries, working for social justice and using their faith. And so it's, it's really interesting to see that connect up again. For we had the nuns in Grand Rapids, the Dominican sisters, donate and volunteer to us, which I thought was pretty cool. I was like, what other political and campaign could say that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Rock on nuns. Okay. So <laughs> thank you so much, Katie. We've, uh, we've, I've really been really pleased um, to have uh, here on Fixing Bugs in Democracy and also in Politics and Polls, Katie Fahey, um, co-founder and executive director at The People, also founder of Voters Not Politicians. Uh, for those of you who've been listening, we're, uh, we'll uh, be archiving this at politicspolls.princeton.edu. We're also going to archive this over at election.princeton.edu. For those of you who want to make a difference in your home state, Whatever it is you care about, um, a good place to start would be redistricting. And uh, I've been pointed out that, uh, it's been pointed out to me that the correct place for people to learn about state-by-state -state initiatives is gonna be at participant.com slash slay the dragon. Once, once again, that's participant.com slash slay the dragon. And that's a great way to learn about uh, redistricting, which was uh, Katie's origin story in terms of creating uh, activism grassroots style. So let's see, we're, uh, we're wrapping up this episode. Katie, thank you so much for uh, coming on. I wish you all the luck with your work and, uh, and, and hope to see you in real life on the other side of this uh, thing that we're facing. Yes, thank you so much for having me and thank you to everybody who's joining in on a Friday night to talk about redistricting. It's so important. 2021 is coming up just around the corner and we can have an impact on the next decade worth of elections. And I'd also say, make sure you fill out your census. So important yeah. to have accurate data. <laughs> My census 2020.gov. My census.2020.gov. As you can tell, I think in terms of URLs. All right, well, that wraps <laughs> up for uh, another episode of uh, both politics and polls. Also, fixing bugs in democracy, our series in, uh, in, in fixing up democracy. Uh, so you can read more about, uh, let's see, to listen to this episode, you can find uh, politics and polls on iTunes, SoundCloud. Stitcher, 
and Spotify. And more important, uh, you can also find a permanent website, yet another website, and the website is politicspolls.princeton.edu. That's got great information, show archives, contact material for guests, much, much more. Uh, I'm reachable on Twitter as Sam Wang, PhD. And I'm uh, at Julian Salazar. Yes, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us, and we will be back soon on Politics and Polls. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, that was awesome. Thank you so much.